and going from the using looking to to math and statistical mechanics for inspiration to solve challenges in theoretical ecology we're going to uh, look for inspirations in biology <laughs> to solve challenges uh, to address challenges in math and maybe create more challenges in math um, and uh, our next speaker is Nina Pfefferman, who is a professor of mathematics and of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Tennessee and the director of the uh, Mathematical Modeling Consulting Center at NIMBIOS. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of hard to follow Simon at the best of times, and it's really hard to transition after thinking about the potential encroachment of the Holocaust. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk to you today probably... Um, when I was asked to talk about this, the first thing I thought was, oh God, what am I going to say to Dimex, this incredibly rich, beautiful community that I have loved being part of. Um, and I thought what I would do is instead of tell you results, I thought it would be fun if I challenged you guys to join me in something I've been thinking about recently. So this is early work. I've published exactly one paper on like Nina's thoughts on this so far. Um, and so it's ripe for, for having people pile on. I would love it if you would join me by talking to me instead of by writing, oh, Nina's an idiot, but I'll take anything I can get on engagement for this. So thank you so much for, for listening to me and for being here, because huzzah, Dimax. Um, I, I, I did want to take a second from my, from my own work talk and tell you how much Dimax has meant to me as a researcher. Um, I was at Dimax as a professor for a, a decade, and among colleagues and students and perspectives that have deeply shaped how I approach everything that I do. And, and the, the biggest thing about me is not so much that any of my work contributes in one area, it's that I love being nomadic. I love snatching insight from, from experts and learning from them and then seeing if I can contribute. And that is something I've just modeled on my existence at Dimex. And without Dimex, I don't think I could do that. And so thank you, Dimex, for that. Um, all right, so now, things I want you to join me in thinking about. Um, all right, so basically, so who here knows that there is a field called bio-inspired design? Or biomimicry, or nature-inspired algorithms, or, okay, so, all right, everyone else trust me, it's a field. Um, and it's something where there's a pretty standard template to papers in bio-inspired design. And, and I will walk you through this and then I will criticize it even though I myself have done this. And so, um, all right, so, so what happens is basically we decide to tackle an open and difficult design challenge. And then we identify some form of analogous problem in nature, and it doesn't have to be analogous to the whole system, it can just be analogous to one of the challenges in the design element. And then we consider how the natural system evolves and solves the analog, uh, usually having something to do with evolutionary biology invoked as assuming that the solution is highly efficient because survival of the fittest, everyone's heard survival of the fittest, right? Everyone is vaguely fed up with survival of the fittest and knows it's mostly bullshit? Excellent, okay. Um, then we take that assumed efficient solution and we tailor that natural solution to fit the design problem, which is not what it was evolved to solve anyway, even if we did assume it was highly efficient. Then we test the solution and then we go, huzzah, it worked beautifully, we're done now. Um, so this is most, most papers you'll pick up in bio-inspired design. Um, it's, of course, predicated on a number of logical fallacies. Um, the first is that efficiency fallacy, that, that any natural system must be efficient. Um, first of all, even if you believe in survival of the fittest, that survival of the fittest to a particular set of selective constraints that are almost guaranteed not to be static, nor are they isolated. Um, most things are trying to compromise, so there's a multi-objective uh, function that's being optimized, even if you believe you can hit the optimum. Um, it also assumes that relative criteria are absolute. That's the biggest part of survival of the fittest. It's kind of annoying. It's, it's not survival of a best. It's survival of everything that isn't so bad that it dies. Um, everything that isn't so bad that it dies is a large set of potentially parallel solutions to things, um, which means that if you borrow an, al uh, an algorithm, even if it seems really efficient, it might be efficient for the wrong set of reasons when you apply it to your design question that isn't necessarily how to be the best minnow. Um, although sometimes minnows are great for things, um, or, or um, uh, 
see, see um, one of the best examples of bio-inspired design is actually high-speed trains in Japan borrowing their, uh, borrowing their nose of the train from the strike angle that um, fishing birds take as they attack fish in the water. Uh, that turned out to work beautifully. Somebody thought, ah, this is a problem that birds must have solved, and then they did that, and it's lovely. But um, that was one of those rare cases where we could go, ah, physics. We kind of understand this problem, and this is exactly the same problem, so we're not really building an analogy so much as solving literally the same problem. Um, and of course, a trivial example of, of why efficiency is silly is rock, paper, scissors. Everyone's played some form of rock, paper, scissors? Yeah, has anyone not played some form of rock, paper, scissors? Okay, so you all understand that if you had to pick a winning strategy in a population of people who are going to choose either rock, paper, or scissors, that whether or not your, your expectation of winning, um, I'm sorry, your expectation of winning is predicated on the distribution of how everyone else in the population is likely to play. So um, you cannot really evolve an efficient way to play rock, paper, scissors, because every time you do that, you've changed the underlying distribution, and then that will shift which one is, is selected for. So I'm gonna argue that what we need to do is start thinking a little bit more like mathematicians about how to take inspiration from biology to come back to algorithmic design. So these analogies in many cases do give us some good strong solutions, but can we do better than these case by case single analogies where you have to have that flash of insight? I love the, um, the, the description of wearing just the right glasses earlier today, that was beautiful. Um, but I think in the case, certainly, of bio-inspired design, we sort of wait to put on just the right glasses and go, oh, fishing birds and trains, um, which is not actually something I think we can always guarantee, and, but also nor is it something I think we should strive to accomplish. So there are ways in which we can talk about why nature solutions frequently work, and that's not so much about how do you optimize something, it's about how do you minimize failure. And so how many people are engineers by training? Okay, engineering is lovely, and most of what engineering talks about, right, is mitigating the probability of failure, right? It's not necessary, it's wonderful if you can get a wonderful success, but what you're really worried about is characterizing and mitigating failure. Um, and so many natural algorithms are startlingly efficient, but what they're really good at is not dying, right? Some, somebody else uh, earlier said, you know, persistence, like still being there, that's biology, that's what biology needs, yep. Um, so these systems solve a, a, di a ridiculous diversity of problems, and, and where Simon earlier very eloquently talked about scaling from micro scale to macro scale, um, what I'd like to do is talk about the, the sheer robustness of the diversity of the algorithms. So how do they do this? And now I'm going to shamelessly just tell you my opinions with no underlying anything because, um, yes. So, <laughs> um, so I have written some of the, is this a pointer? No, this, this is a pointer, no. Okay, I've written some of these in a paper on the, something titled close enough to this that if you're interested, you can find it. Um, so if you would like to understand why I'm choosing these things to tell you, I have argued it, but here are the things that I think are important to why biological systems in general are good at solving these kinds of design challenges, not so much because they're efficient, but because they don't fail. One is the use of proximity, and I'll define all of these in a second, um, but I won't justify them, I'll just define them and go on. Um, they, use, they rely heavily on proximate cues. They're not necessarily measuring the thing they want, they're measuring an easier thing to measure that's highly correlated. Um, and that can screw you up, absolutely. Um, they're using distributed decision making. There's not one centralized point of failure for a, and now I'm using the word decision as a human, but it doesn't have to be an active cognitive decision. It can simply be the thing that determines the outcome. And they utilize error convergence well. There's both feedback and feed forward. That means that if you get the answer slightly wrong, you either continue going further wrong in a clever way, or it moves you back towards the center of what you were hoping. So proximate cues really boil down to what is it that you really need to know? What are the reliable signals? And that doesn't mean perfect, it means generally reliable signals of the thing you need to know. And how easy or efficient is it to measure and use the signal that you want to rely on? And again, that can, that can be literally the thing you care about, or it can be the pro a proximate cue that is related to the thing you care about and is easy to measure and reliable enough that you get there. And many biological systems, including some of my favorites, 
rely on proximate cues for things that they really need to solve, and they don't care at all about the cue they're actually measuring. And sometimes this screws you up, like climate change and mosquitoes, where there's a known and predictive relationship between mosquitoes using photoperiod, the length of the day, to figure out when they should transition, what kinds of provision of eggs, when they should stop ovipositing and overwinter instead, things like that. What they're really trying to do is get temperature, right? Mosquitoes don't particularly care about light so much. But throughout evolutionary history for these mosquitoes, it's been a reasonable approximation of when is winter coming, when it's getting darker out. That turns out to be a bad idea when temperatures are changing and light is not. So that can screw you up, but it's a good proximate cue, and that's a good example of something easy to observe in, in the life of a mosquito that would be maybe hard to observe, you know, well, I don't know, how, how quickly is the temperature cooling is possibly a harder thing for a mosquito to make a decision about. Uh, and again, I'm anthropomorphizing mosquitoes, and I'm okay with that. Um, distributed decisions. So who needs to know what? What, if anything, do individuals need to share? Do, are the things they're sharing also proximate cues, or are the things they're sharing their decisions about proximate cues? Um, all of, the, and again, um, now I can anthropomorphize proteins, and cells, and organisms, and populations, and ecosystems. Um, what are the decisions? What are the actions based on those decisions? And how do proximate cues propagate across those decisions? If I have one mosquito who makes an incorrect decision about of a position because of day length, meaning temperature, and, that, and something else in the ecosystem is making a decision based on watching the behavior of the mosquito, have I accidentally destabilized my entire ecosystem and now I've lost bats? I don't know, I'm making this up. But right, everyone gets how this can propagate badly. Yes? All right. Also, can't tell if the level of energy is down because we've all listened to like 37 talks in the last hour, or if, everyone good? Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay, um, and we have some great examples in nature of, of profoundly distributed decision making where it's active decisions being made, like honeybees, which are beautiful decision makers, but we also know things like quorum sensing and bacteria, and simply, um, if you take away the action of cognition in the decision making, cascading physical properties of systems are, are still decision makers in this sense. Um, and of course, error convergence. So how inaccurate are the measurements or decisions? And this can be all sorts of uncertainty. It can be epistemic, it can be environmental. Um, do the errors compound or self-correct by the feedback mechanisms that are involved and at what scale? Um, and then how many measurements or decisions do we need to converge in these errors? So that's to converge either in citing this whole thing is unstable, we're leaving to a stable point of a different system, or we've collapsed. Um, and we've got some elegant examples from, from neuron firing. And so, so I'm giving particular examples, but these do happen across biological systems. And there are good examples from many biological systems of each of these in isolation. And then, of course, uh, and now I'm totally just going to assert things. Um, the, the coolest systems to me in biology are the ones where we have uh, all three in some combination working together. We get things that are then robust to critical failure, resilient to perturbation, and efficient across contexts and scales. Um, and there are good ways to describe mathematically how these elements play with each other in order to create that robustness and resilience. So I actually propose that when we now think about bio-inspired design, we stop thinking about specific analogies. We stop going, oh, here's a bird and it does what we need. We instead go, Nature uses design elements to do some things. If we want to do a new thing, let's borrow from those design elements, but design from scratch using those tools as opposed to find those analogies and start using the tools of proximate cues, distributed decisions, and error convergence in order to design what is still a bio-inspired design set of algorithms because we're learning those toolkits from nature, but we are not then having to put on just the right glasses to find a bird. Um, and so this is my final slide that has nothing to do particularly with this research, but I also wanted to say Dymex has also helped me build an incredibly rich, diverse, and brilliant community of people who've, not only that I've collaborated with, but then been able to attract to work with me that I have trained. These have been my postdocs and graduate students in my career so far. Many of them have come to me through Dymex. They're highlighted in red. They're all brilliant and wonderful, and even the conversations that I have with those who are not through Dymex have been shaped by my experience at Dymex. And so thank you all for being that community from whom I have learned.
one super quick while the panel is setting up, one super quick question. Any? Yes, quick one though. <laughs> But the panel, please, uh, perhaps set up. Yeah, uh, when we watch the swallows, it seems like uh, your action is my proximate cue because they never run into each other. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I think that is an, a brilliant example of how, and that, that's also distributed decision making for if you want to describe where the, oh, am I off? Thank you, sorry. Um, yes, absolutely, that's a wonderful example of proximate cues and distributed decision making, and in fact also error convergence, because small corrections propagate. So yes, I think that's a, a beautiful example of all of these things. 